morning, we bless you and praise you and thank you for all of your excellent greatness, your mighty works towards your people. In Jesus' name, everybody say praise the Lord. Praise Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Tim. As always, great job. Uh, Suzanne and Mike, again, uh, I know they get tired of hearing this and they're a little embarrassed by it, but I'm not embarrassed to say I appreciate them so much and all that they're doing and all of the, such a blessing to Sally and I and to all of you, you know, and uh, it's, it's great. Praise the Lord. We appreciate it. And uh, welcome back, Ron. Praise the Lord. Welcome back, everybody. Amen. That are here. And welcome to everybody that's out there in the uh, cyber world, amen, on Facebook, watching and being a part of this service. You are a part of it. We are one spirit, amen. And we know the, the uh, geographic distances are one thing for humans, but it means nothing to the spirit. And uh, we're, we're appreciative of all of you. I want to give a special shout out. And I probably shouldn't do this because if I did, I'd do it for everybody. But I'm going to do it anyway. I appreciate uh, Roy and uh, Karen Goodson sent me a nice note. And... Uh, encouragement and I'm, I really appreciate it Amen. and uh, all of you I mean everybody that uh, is continuing to support the church and in this awkward time for all of us and praise the Lord it's God's got it all under control and we just need to put our confidence in him but I am grateful for the outreach from different ones and I want to say another thank you to uh, Andy Wyckoff and Wyckoff Industries they covered the uh, cost of the uh, electrical issue that we had out here that really wasn't even an air conditioning issue to begin with. It was the electrical, but uh, they have been such a blessing to this church and to me personally. And I know it's given unto the Lord, but people got to do it in order for God to be able to do it. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of that. Man, I'm acting like a 13-year-old girl here, praise God. I'm sorry, I'm being sexist. Praise the Lord. Amen. Most stuff doesn't uh, touch me that way, but this does. Amen. So thank God for the feelings that we can have, praise the Lord, even if it's a little awkward at times. Amen. And uh, I want to uh, give a shout out to the good old U.S. of A. Amen. It is my country. Praise the Lord. And God bless America. Amen. <laughs> Sally came uh, adorned in the human flag. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and amen. But this, I know this country has faults. Hell, I grew up here. I'm 72, you know, so it isn't like I'm not aware of the issues, but it's still the best country going. I mean, we still have opportunities in spite of a lot of the things that the government tries to put on us and different things, but uh, it's still a great place. And it has, it has some ugliness in its history like all of us do. But there's beauty ahead if we can just keep moving forward. There's, there's a plan that God has. God bless America is what I'm praying. And, and I mean that for every person in this country, that we all have the opportunities that God intended for us to have that are in the Constitution. Amen. And so uh, it's, a, it's a great document because it's based on Christian values. Yes. The problem is we don't have enough Christians in the government, amen, to uh, understand that and to try to per perpetuate it. So, but nevertheless, I'm not putting my confidence in the Republicans or the Democrats or the Independents. I'm putting my confidence in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And he's above all of it. So praise God. I believe we've got a great future ahead of us. Amen. I don't know how long it'll be, but I believe it's going to be glorious because God's going to be involved in it. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. So thank the Lord for that. And, uh, you know, just, just remember, just because you want a book of matches doesn't mean you know how to use fireworks. Hallelujah. It's like I always say, just because you have a voice doesn't mean you have something to say. Praise the Lord. Pick up the newspaper, turn on the radio, amen. It's all out there, hallelujah. But hey, I just, speaking of uh, learning things, I just learned that humans eat more bananas than monkeys. I mean, I can't even remember the last time I ate a monkey. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Mike. Mike's on the same page with me this morning. Praise the Lord. You know what the difference is between most politicians and flying pigs? The letter F. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, well, hallelujah. Uh, you know, a red blood count is actually a communist vampire. <laughs> blood count. Okay, well, you're enjoying these so much, I'll give you one more. 
I was watching a weird show the other day, my, my youngest daughter. I got an iPhone. I've done nothing but flip phones since they've been flip phones, or since they've been all that stuff. So I finally took the plunge and got an iPhone and thought, you know, just different ways I can communicate with, you know, just things I can do that I couldn't do before, but I have to learn. I told my youngest, or my daughter that lives in uh, New Jersey, she tried to call me and I couldn't figure out the voicemail on it. And I just finally got it figured out and texted her back and just said, uh, sorry, this is a learning cur curve, but it's actually more like a learning cliff than a curve, <laughs> praise the Lord. But little by little, my youngest daughter who's grown up with this stuff and she's helping me learn some of it. So anyway, she got us Roku and uh, Sally didn't want it, <laughs> praise the Lord. So I had it put upstairs and uh, where I spend a lot of time. And anyway, so I'm trying to figure this thing out because it's altogether different than Dish and, you know, Direct TV and everything, you got to go through a different process and change stuff around. Anyway, so I'm figuring it out a little bit. But anyway, I saw this skeleton comic on there and he was trying tibia, little humorous. <laughs> tibia, little humorous, praise the Lord. That was all a pack of lies, except for the part about the Roku. Amen. <laughs> I didn't see anything on there, I just read this, praise God. Anyway, it's great, and uh, I feel like I've moved into the uh, 21st century. Uh, and I'm lost, praise the Lord. So just little by little, I'm, I'm getting it little by little. And it's, it, there's a, I, I like challenges, you know. I mean, we, we need challenges, and that's, this is certainly one for me because I'm just, uh, really haven't been on that page yet. But I'm learning. Little by little, I'm getting more and more used to it. And there's some neat stuff there that you can use and take advantage of. Amen. So thank the Lord for that. And uh, stop rambling and move on here. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2. These are uh, two scriptures that I used last week. Actually, I was using uh, Hebrews uh, 1, 1 through 4. But I'm just going to set this up because I want to talk about some of the same things. The Lord is still dealing with me about this. And I, uh, I, I felt like, oh, you're gonna, this is repetitious. And, and uh, you know, so, but the Lord wouldn't back off. And so I feel like this is really what the Lord had for me to share with you this morning. And I believe that it is by the Spirit, praise the Lord, based on everything else that's been said. Uh, it just, again, uh, accentuates what God is saying to me and, and uh, helps me to feel like, okay, I'm, a, I'm not totally random here. I am on the right page, so praise the Lord. <clears throat> but in Hebrews, uh, he says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Praise the Lord. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. Colossians 2 and verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And uh, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Praise the Lord. Amen. So Jesus was uh, heaven's uh, thoughts, words, principles, uh, plans. He was the pattern of living that was made a visible and verbal manifestation on the earth for everybody to see, for everybody to have opportunity to experience. And Jesus was the, the brightest display of God's glory and greatest expression of God's personality ever to be revealed, ever to happen in all of eternity. Amen. Matthew 27, verses 50 and 51. Praise God. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and rocks rent. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. Praise the Lord. I, it's on the heart of God, I believe, to get our attention on Jesus and not on everything else. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. He's got a, 
a means by which he's going to do this, and it's through Jesus, through the body of Christ, amen, that he's going to cooperate with to bring about the things that he has foreordained. I mean, this is not, this, none of this is a shock to God. I know Tim talks about that a lot of times, a lot of times to us, because it's such an unusual thing and such an unexpected thing. We feel like maybe it caught God off guard. Believe me, it didn't. He knew about this before the foundation of the world. Amen. And we were designed. We were created for a time such as this. We're here for a reason. We're here because we were supposed to be here at this time. Lives are not just random things that take place in here. God has a purpose for people, and he puts them in the place where they need to be at the time they need to be there. It's, I mean, we know the story of Esther, but that's just an example of how God operates in the earth with human beings. Amen? And so, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So there's the literal, uh, the the rent, the veil being rent at the crucifixion of Jesus, which was a physical event that took place and was recorded historically. But Jesus said, that's just like everything else in Scripture, it's pointing to a spiritual reality that's greater than that physical thing that took place. And so, by a new and living way, we are able to have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which, have which He has consecrated for us through the veil, that's to say His flesh. The thing that kept us between God and man. Amen? And so Jesus rent the veil that kept us from seeing God. He kept us, he, he, he rent the veil that kept us from hearing God, from being able to communicate. Our, the scripture calls it dullness of hearing. Amen? And so he made the way for God to come and dwell personally, amen, within each one of us. Our bodies then become the temple of the Holy Ghost or the temple of God, a dwelling place the scripture says, for the Most High. Praise the Lord. And, and so, thank the Lord. We are, first, look, let, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6.19. And we know the scripture. We talk about it all the time. But it's basically that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the dwelling place of God. Amen. You are where God lives on this earth. Praise the Lord. Just, and it's just as real as us being seated with Him in heavenly places. He is seated with us, or He's seated within us. Amen. Here on earth. Praise the Lord. So what? Know ye not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Amen. We are then built together. You're, she's a temple. You're a temple. You're a temple. You're a temple. We're all temples of the Holy Spirit individually, but we are then built together as a spiritual house, amen, where the fullness of God can dwell. The fullness of God dwelt in Jesus. Now, we are the body of Christ. Now, I have the fullness of God, but the way the fullness of God is able to manifest is through the, group, through the body of Christ, not through just one individual, but through as we come together in faith, God is able to do greater things and be bigger, and it, 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 it magnifies the Lord. You know, that's what the scripture says, David said, come and magnify the Lord with me. The more we are praising God, the more we're aware of God, the more we're conscious of God, the, the more we magnify the Lord, the more real He becomes. Praise the Lord. And so, that's what we're up to. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Praise the Lord. That, that sound, that language of we were created for a time like this, it just, that has been going through my mind for the last couple of weeks. It just doesn't go away. Amen. And so I know that the Lord is speaking. We're here for a purpose. Amen. We're, we didn't just because our parents fell in love or whatever happened to get us here, amen, that, that was just a physical thing that took place. But God had a plan, and He just used human beings, amen, to make this thing come to pass. And He put us here, amen, right now, because we are the ones that He's going to use, amen, to bring about a manifestation of God like this world has never seen before. I believe that with all of my heart. Before Jesus comes back, there's going to be a manifestation, amen, of His body in this earth. Praise the Lord. The scripture that we read earlier, he said, you know, he's going to come, but he's going to come. And when he comes, we're going to be here. We're going to be with him. We're going to be part of that thing. Amen. And so now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and, the and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth up unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God 
through the Spirit. Praise the Lord. And that's possible because Jesus, the God-man, amen, was the beginning of a whole new race of God-created beings, yeah. which we are identical to. We are twin brothers and sisters. There's no, you know, there's no gender here. We're not talking, when we say the, children, the sons of God, we're talking about everybody. It's like, you know, there are tigers, male tigers, and female tigers. They're just tigers, right? Yeah, there's two different kinds, but they're still tigers. We are sons of God. Amen. Male sons, female sons, as far as God's concerned. Praise the Lord. So Jesus was the firstborn, the scripture says, among many brethren. In other words, he's the prototype of a whole new creation that's being conformed to his image. That's what's happening right now. We are being conformed. Amen. We are his image in the earth. But now we are literally being conformed to that image because of the pressures, because of the circumstances that are going on around us. Now, when everything's going good and there's no uh, tribulation, there's no stress, there's no, we can get to kind of be ourselves a little bit more. But not in these kind of times. In these kind of times, we need to be conformed to Jesus Christ in order to bring about what God has declared to be the reality of this earth. Amen. To be the truth of His Word. Hallelujah. Amen. So look, look here in uh, John 16, verse 7. John 16 and verse 7. I'm excited. I've got to say, I'm a little anxious because I'm a human. But I am excited in the Spirit. I really feel there is something so unique and so unusual that's going to take place. So a godly thing that, that we haven't seen. Not generations haven't seen this. I'm, I'm talking about probably back to the book of Acts before there has been this kind of uh, manifestation of what God is going to do. And if you think about the pressures that we have going on in the earth today, that's similar to what was taking place back in that time. It's those pressures that bring God's glory out. It's in the darkness fills the earth. Amen. His light Amen. Shines brightest. Praise the Lord. So there's a greater visibility of God when there's more confusion and chaos and darkness. Amen. God's light shines brighter. They can't deny that it's God. Amen. So nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He said, I'm telling you the truth. It's expedient or it's best for you that I go away. Because if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Okay? Uh, verses 13 through 15 now. Still in John 16. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Now, it's just like Jesus. Of course, it is... Christ in you, the hope of glory, or you can say it's the Spirit of God, or it's the Holy Spirit, it's all the same. But this is exactly, Jesus is saying, I'm going to do the same thing by the Spirit that I did as a man. I'm, only, I'm not going to be talking about me, I'm going to be talking about what my Father says. I'm only going to be saying what my Father is saying, I'm only going to be doing what my Father does. And so he's saying, that's what the Holy Spirit's doing, I'm going to go away. But it's for your benefit because he's going to come back and everything he says is going to be what the Father is saying. Everything that he moves you to do is going to be what the Father is doing. Amen? And so we have the Holy Spirit now. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Praise the Lord. So the spiritual gifts, the power of God, the anointing of God, and all that is what he says was mine. And now I'm sharing that with you by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So after Jesus ascended bodily, uh, just think about this. After he went to heaven, the world wasn't able to see the fullness of God anymore. The fullness of God dwelled in him bodily. So when he was here, there was visible, tangible evidence of God's reality. Amen. But once he went away... That disappeared with him. Amen. And so they couldn't see it in the flesh anymore. But Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is actually the, uh, I say the author of the Bible. He's the one that moved on men to write what God had in his heart. Amen. For men to ha understand. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 kind of explains that to us. Amen. That all scripture is given by inspiration or by revelation, you could say, of God. So the Holy Spirit had to bring that revelation because revelation just doesn't come on its own. It comes by the Holy Spirit. So all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, 
for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, man or woman, male or female, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, or God works is how that translates literally. So, so that we can be perfect, so we just like Jesus, you know, brothers and sisters, we are because of righteousness, we have to be taught that, the, understand the righteousness of God, that we may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all of God's works. Praise the Lord. So the Bible is now the revelation of God. Amen. Jesus was the physical revelation of God. Now the Bible is the revelation of God for us today. So through the Bible and the Holy Spirit, God wants to walk and talk with us. Amen. And he wants to do it in an individual and personal intimate relationship. Praise the Lord. And that's why the reading of the Bible is important. Not that you're supposed to get check marks or stars because you read so many verses today or you read through the Bible in a year or whatever. No, it, it can be random because God wants to talk to you through this. Amen. And if you have some Bible in you, you don't necessarily have to be reading. It can be just like Don sitting out on the deck at, uh, you know, or porch or whatever at five o'clock in the morning and God just speaks. And you know if it's God or not, because if it's not in relate, relating to his word or if it's not uh, coinciding with his word, then you know it's coming from your own mind or it's coming from someplace else. But if it validates what God's Word says, you know it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Amen? And so if, if you're reading through the Bible, He can quicken things to us as well. And that's, that's the reason for the Holy Spirit, amen, to come upon us. Amen? So God wants to have this relationship with us, and now it comes by His Word instead of through Jesus, the man, Jesus. Amen? And so if we're not equipped then how are we going to share Jesus with anybody? How is anybody that's not a believer going to know this? Because they're not reading this, and they're not believing it if they did read it. Right? So we have to be that manifestation, and it's by the Spirit that He wants to do it. Because intellectually, we can read this. I mean, we, we all ha have known probably theologians or uh, theology professors. My uh, pastor, when I was a little kid, was a theology professor at Drake. I'm just saying, I don't think the guy had a relationship with Jesus. He knew a lot about theology. He knew a lot about religion, but he never preached a born-again experience. He never had, you had to receive Christ into your heart by faith and confess him with your mouth. That was never a, a question. You just got baptized into the local church to become a member of the church. It wasn't about your sins being washed away or anything else. You reach a certain age of accountability. I think it was 12 or whatever, and then, that, then you just automatically were baptized. So, and I'm not trying to disparage the guy. I'm just saying... There's millions of people out there that know theology, but they have no concept of God himself. They have no relationship, no intimacy, no reality of God operating in their lives. They just know about him. Praise the Lord. And so he wants us to have this intimacy. He wants us to have this thing come alive to us. All right. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 17. Acts 2, 17. Praise God. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. How many of you want to believe this is the last days? Hallelujah. God said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In other words, they're going to be moved by the Holy Spirit. In the last days, the Holy Spirit is what's going to be directing these people. Amen. Not, not religion, not just uh, moral behavior but the Holy Spirit is himself. Amen. So the church is the body of Christ in the earth. Amen. And it's now, I, I believe, and this is what I feel like the Lord is speaking to me, we're in the days of transition. Amen. And I don't like saying that because I want to believe, I want to believe it's already done because it is in the mind of Christ. But I also know in reality we're, we're not there. I mean, we, we, we have this hunger, we have this drive by the Holy Spirit, but we have not yet arrived or we would be seeing things that we're not seeing. But we know are in our heart and, know, and believe that they should be. We're just not quite there yet. Amen. And so the, I believe that what God is saying to me is we're in a transition. Amen. From the age of the mortal church... Amen. The physical church, amen, into the kingdom age. Praise the Lord, where God's going to rule, amen, where God's going to do, uh, have dominion, amen. So the Holy Spirit brings us enlightenment, amen, on Scripture and revelation knowledge concerning the reality and the application of this truth. Praise the Lord. And so it's, it's one thing to have a thought or to think maybe so, but if it's the Holy Ghost, He's going to show you why. He's going to show you how this is possible. Amen. And so just think for a second. Now, I've used this example before, but it's, it's so pertinent today. The just shall live by faith. 
Everybody say praise the Lord. We know that, right? We've, we've quoted all the time. How about Ephesians, if, if you will, uh, Suzanne, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So we know the just shall live by faith. Praise the Lord. If you're justified, you, you have to live by faith. Amen? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. We didn't do anything to get saved. All we did was receive what God had already made available to us. It wasn't an act of, of good works or anything on our part other than just to believe and receive. Amen? Not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen? So think about this. Hundreds of years ago, Martin Luther read those scriptures. Amen. They had the full Bible. They had it all. He read those scriptures. He read them probably hundreds of times, no doubt. This guy was a priest. He read them maybe a thousand times before the spirit of revelation made known to him the result or the reality of their meaning. And what happened? The Protestant Revolution. The Reformation. See, here's what the Lord is saying to me. A true revelation always brings revolutionary change. Yes. Think about Jesus, the revelation of God. Was there not a revolutionary change coming up to pass when he was here? He was turning the whole thing upside down. Everything that they had based all of their history, the Jewish people on. Amen. He's saying, no more. God's got a better plan. Amen. Revelation brings revolutionary change. And I believe that's where we're at on the brink of something so revolutionary no generation except maybe the first generation has ever experienced it. We've talked about it. We've prayed about it. We've shouted about it. We've tried to, uh, you know, mimic it and try to do things. But God has to be the one that does it. Praise the Lord. So a true revelation brings revolutionary change. Martin Luther didn't invent new scripture. He didn't just come up with a new thought or a new idea. He didn't invent it. But he did receive a true revelation about what had been written thousands of years before. Had been there all that time. Think of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people who had read that and never got a revelation. But at the right time, in the fullness of time, you might say, God sent forth a revelation. Amen? To one man. Now, this guy was far from perfect. If you know anything, but he, was a, uh, he, was a, he was a Jew hater. He was anti-Semitic. He, he had a lot of bad issues. But he was willing to listen and hear what thus saith the Lord. So it isn't based on, God doesn't give revelation based on how good you are or how perfect you live your life. He gives it to you based on will you receive it? Will you accept it? Will you step forward on it? Will you take the risk? And I mean, listen, that was a big risk. The Catholic Church was burning people at the stake for a thousand years practically, or at least hundreds of years, for anybody who defied their teaching. Believe me, this was a defiance of their teaching because it just threw all the rituals out the window and just said, hey, we're just live by faith, not by how many candles you can burn, not how, but how many Hail Marys and all the other stuff that I'm not trying to ridicule. I'm just saying all the things that were thought to be what bring you closer to God or what brings God closer to you. Amen. So we're, we're reading scriptures right now. This is why I, I feel it in the Holy Spirit right now. We're reading scriptures right now. Amen. That I believe. The Holy Spirit is going to illuminate and activate into a full reality in these last days. It's going to come to the body. It's not, it's not going to be some preacher or some uh, prophet over here or somebody else. It's going to come to the body of Christ. They're going to start getting revelation and doing what we do here. Is, that's why it's so powerful. Because you can share. If God gives something to you, it's unique. He doesn't have to give it to me if He gives it to you and then you share it with me. Right? I mean, look at... Uh, he, didn't, he didn't tell anybody but Martin Luther. But we had a whole Protestant re re Reformation come out of that because of one man beginning to share the revelation that God gave him. And that's what's powerful about us coming together here on Sundays and, and sharing the things that God is saying to us because it's a revelation to you that he hasn't had to speak to me. He doesn't need to speak it to everybody. If one par part of the body has heard it, he can share it with the rest of the body. And it will resonate. It will, uh, it will identify with the Spirit. It'll bear witness, amen, that it's the truth, amen. And so I believe we're on the verge of the greatest restorational movement that there has ever been. 
Amen. I, I believe it with all my heart. And these revelations or these illuminations, amen, and activations are going to bring a wave of restoration that is described in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 10, and verse 15. Excuse me. Revelation 11 and verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and forever. Amen. Great voices in heaven. There's a great cloud of witnesses. Amen. And they're bearing witness with those of us that are here now. And they're saying, this is, this is the generation. This is the ones. Amen. And they're bearing witness. And, amen. That we become the, the, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord. And as it was said, he's not going to say, would you please uh, uh, vote by, uh, you know, absentee ballot? Or would you go to the thing and vote? Or would you do this? Or would you do that? No, he's going to say, here's the deal. The just will live by faith. You're going to live by faith or you're not going to live. You won't be able to make it if you don't live the way I'm telling you to live. The options are no longer here. Amen. So, praise the Lord. Uh, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. Jesus, he says, right? He said, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. Who's our Lord? Jesus, right? Now look at this. And of His Christ, the anointed. That's the body. That's us. We are the anointed now. Amen. So it's the kingdoms of this world, amen, have become the kingdoms of Jesus and His church. Amen. Glory to God, His body. On the earth, amen? The church is the bride of Christ and has to be prepared, has to be clothed, has to be made ready for the wedding day. What does the wedding symbolize? And that's always been awkward for me thinking as a man that I'm marrying another man. You know what I mean? I, you know, I'm not, but you know what I'm saying. It's just the, the natural way of looking at it. But the truth is he's just talking about becoming one. Being one with the Lord. Amen. In other words, we become aware. We become aware of our identity in Christ, of our true identity. Amen. And of God's, uh, amen, revelation being revealed, amen, through us. We are now the fullness of God. The fullness of the Godhead, I should say, dwells in us bodily on this earth. We are the representation. We are just like Jesus. We are a new creation. Amen. The church bride has to be fully clothed, the scripture says, with the wedding garments, amen, which are the garment of salvation. The robe of righteousness, the garment of praise, the armor of God, and fully equipped with the weapons of warfare, which are the gifts of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Amen. The sword is the Word of God, which is made sharp by the revelation knowledge given by the Holy Spirit. This Word is irrelevant if it isn't a witness by the Holy Spirit. It's just another book. It's the Holy Spirit that makes it a weapon, amen, for God against the enemies, amen, of our soul. Amen. Our mind, our will, our emotions. Our spirit's fine. It's, it's cooking. I mean, it's, it's set up. It's finished. It's good. We're already seated with Him in heavenly places. But the soul's got to be dealt with. And the, what the soul receives is once it becomes a, a, a reality and we see it, what, what happens is what the Holy Spirit does is quicken what's already in our spirit to make sense to our mind. He quickens it to your senses, amen, to, to witness what you're feeling in the Holy Ghost. That's why when you read something that you hadn't understood before and you read it and you go, whoa, what's the deal with this? I've read this a hundred times and I never saw it before. Well, Martin Luther, for example, how many times did he read it before, bang, one day he goes, whoa, this is what the Lord's saying. It wasn't about get a different kind of robe or different beads or whatever. It's, this is what he's saying. It isn't about what we're doing. It's about what he's already done and are identifying with that. Amen? So the sword. Praise the Lord. Look, let, let's look at this. Luke chapter 1, verses 71 through 79. Luke 1, 71 through 79. That we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life and thou child now think about this he's talking to John the Baptist but the truth is what was John the Baptist he was the uh, the forerunner 
In other words, he came before Jesus was revealed. We, this is symbolic. It, it's symbolism. It's typed. We are the foreshadow. We are the ones who usher in the return of the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so he's talking to us. Now, he was talking to John when it was written, but he was talking to us by the Holy Spirit. That was a physical thing. This is the spiritual truth. Amen. So thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet in the way of peace. I'm, tell I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit knows what he's doing. And he's had this plan for centuries, for thousands of years, for millennia, from time immemorial. Amen. To bring us to an understanding of these truths so we could walk in the power of his anointing and the reality of who we are in Christ. So that God can come back for a church who has made herself ready. Praise the Lord. And how do we make ourselves ready? Not by the works that we do, but by a revelation of His Word. By an understanding of what it is He's really trying to say and do through us. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Acts chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Acts 3, 20 and 21. Praise God. And He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until, or hold and tell the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. This thing has got to come to pass. It's got to be completely fulfilled. Amen. And we, amen, shall ascend, He shall send Jesus Christ, which was preached before unto you, whom the heaven must retain or hang on to and tell the times of restitution or restoration. Of all things, everything that God said in that first century, or actually all the, everything God has said all the way back to Genesis, has to be fulfilled. Praise God. I mean, it's weird, but at the same time, think. Think what a privileged generation this is to be able to experience everything that He's ever prophesied, that we're going to be a part of that, that we're going to experience it and be the, the ones who usher it into a world who is completely in darkness and knows nothing. The, the, the only thing they do know about is a little bit of religion. Just enough to make them hate God and everybody involved. Right? Because everything that's happening must be, a, must be the Lord. Must be the judgments of God. No, it's stupid people. It's humans. Like it always has been. Praise God. So here, just think about Paul and you know, all the two thirds of the New Testament he wrote. So when you read it, you got to understand he justified his teachings not not just with the Old Testament scriptures, but also on the authority of the Spirit of Revelation. He didn't just say, "Well, that's thus saith the Lord," because when he was doing that, he was trying to kill the church. It wasn't until he got a revelation by the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ was Lord that everything got turned around. So he didn't just use Old Testament scriptures to say, because obviously there wasn't a New Testament at the time, to, to, to dictate what he was going to do or how he was going to do it. He said, no, I used the scriptures, but only by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Because until Jesus came to him and said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Paul said, who are you? The church whom you persecuted. See, the, the government would have a, it'd be a good time for the government to get a revelation. Amen. They're persecuting Jesus. They're not persecuting Nathan. They're not persecuting Jane or John. John, you know, Paul. He, he, they're persecuting Christ. When they start shutting down churches and telling you it's not good to go to church, you can't go to church, it's not essential to go to church. Just tells you how ignorant they are. It's not essential to them because they don't believe. But it damn sure is essential to anybody who is a believer. Amen. Now, I understand, I'm not saying feel guilty because you're not here. I get it. I mean, I understand the, the physical and health issues and all the other stuff. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just saying it ought to be our decision whether we go to church or don't go to church and not the government or not some politician or not somebody else who has another agenda that they're not sharing with us. Yeah. Think and trying to make me believe they're doing it for my well-being. Yeah. Listen, I've lived long enough in this country to know 
the government hasn't done a whole lot for anybody for their well-being. They're feathering their own nest and trying to perpetuate their careers and their millions and so on and so forth. I'm sorry, I shouldn't get political, but that's just my belief. That's just, I know there are some good people there, some people trying to do the right things. But I'm telling you, without the Holy Ghost, without God, it ain't going to happen. Not by the government. They're, they're almost created to be uh, animosity between the people and the leaders. Amen? Why? Because we're not supposed to just trust people because they say, everybody else is a jerk but me. You know, everybody else is a liar, but I'm telling the truth. You know, everybody else wants your money. I don't. I want to give you money. I want to give you... Praise the Lord. If you hear, I'm in jail. Mike? Thank you, brother. Praise the Lord. He said he had the first bail money. For Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. Ephesians 3, uh, 1 through 6. Praise God. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles... If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. What was the mystery? The Old Testament, because he thought he understood it, and then he found out, I'm just reading words off a page. But it was by inspiration. It was by revelation, amen, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So you'll know why I know what I know, by the Holy Spirit, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Why? Because the Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out. That's why Jesus said, it's, it's to your benefit that I go away. Because as it is now, I can only impact the people that are in my physical presence. But when I send back the Holy Spirit, everybody has opportunity for revelation. Yeah. Amen. So which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Hallelujah. So the Bible is the highest authority and has the final say in every matter. In any matter. Amen. It's the revelation of God in written form just as Jesus was the revelation of God in human form. Praise the Lord. And this book was inspired by the Holy Spirit and given to men so we can fulfill thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just what it says, amen, in Revelation. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of Jesus and His church. Woo! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. His anointed. Glory to God. That's us. People say, well, you need, you need to have somebody lay hands on you so you can receive an anointing. Man, you got, all the, you got the anointed one. You got where anointing comes from. Amen. I'm not against laying on of hands. I'm just saying, if you understand what you have, you be laying hands on somebody else. You're not looking for somebody to lay hands on you. You are anointed. You have the anointed one. Yes. Amen. So Jesus was, look, he was guided by divine revelation knowledge. And so we have to be as well. He said, I only do what I see my father do. What, what was he seeing? He was having revelation, understanding. Amen. Eyes that see, eyes but don't see, right? Ears but they don't hear. It could be said about the church. Because if you think about it, the world doesn't have eyes to see. Not in the spirit. They don't have ears to hear what the spirit is saying. All they've got to go by is what they can see, what they can touch and feel and hear with their natural ears. Amen. So look at Psalms 40 and verse 8. Oh, we couldn't have picked a better time to be born if we had a choice. Praise the Lord. I delight to do thy will. How many of you know what the will of God is? His word. That's what David is saying. I delight to do your word. Oh, my God. Yea, your word is in my heart. Didn't God tell us the day's coming? Right now, the, the law is written on tablets, on stones, the Torah. But he said, I'm going to write it in your heart. Now, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. So that it's not just words on a page, 
but it's a reality that comes from within us. The spirit truth. Amen? Praise the Lord. So, Revelation is divinely inspired impression or a flash of thought from God. It's like reading God's mind for a split second. Or God transmitting thought to you. And just like that, it comes. I mean, think. Hundreds of times you read this. Yeah, it's true. It's good. And then in a split second, all of those hundreds of times that you read it are almost irrelevant because it has taken on a real, true meaning. It's not just words on a page anymore. Now it's a part of my life. It's a reality that I live with, that I experience on a regular basis. Amen? So, it's Revelation is it's, it's conceived in your spirit. And this is what I was trying to say a moment ago. And then it's birthed into your natural understanding by divine illumination. Praise the Lord. The witness of the Spirit. Praise God. That's how we... I, I would that you prosper even as your soul prospers. And we think, you know, for years it was... It, it, the soul and the spirit were considered synonymous, but that's totally untrue. The spirit, we are spirit beings, we live in a body, and we have, or, yeah, we live in a body, and we have a soul. When your mind, will, and emotions connect with the spirit, believe me, you're going to prosper in every area of life. Right? Because, why? Because what he's saying is, when you get revelation, it will cause your mind to be renewed to the spirit. It will make your mind think like your spirit thinks. And I believe that is what God's going to do in this last days. There's going to be such a, a synchronism, amen, between soul and spirit that we have not seen. It, certainly not in our lifetimes, and I don't think in generations before us. If there were, it was only brief periods of time where somebody like a Martin Luther or someone else, a Calvin, or somebody who had a revelation of the Word of God, and it changes everything, creates a revolution. Only this is one that's going to bring everything together, not just one piece here that's going to start another denomination or one little piece over here that's going to start another teaching of some kind, but it's going to mesh in a way that it blows out. It becomes uh, alive. It blooms, in other words, where, where it's visible to everybody, not just to us individually. Praise the Lord. Amen. So Jesus received direction for His ministry that way. And so we have to do it as well. Amen. If we're going to grow up into the full stature of Jesus, which the Scripture says we do before His return, then we have to do what He did. We have to operate by spiritual revelation, by divine intervention, by God speaking to us by the Spirit. Amen? Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 21. And that's literally what Jesus... See, Jesus had the Holy Spirit. Did He not? The Holy Spirit came in, you know, in the form of a dove and rested upon him, showing that the Spirit of God was on him. And he said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So when Jesus says things like, I only say what I hear my Father say, he's not, he's not hearing audible voices, I don't think. And he's not seeing naturally God doing this or healing somebody or whatever. He's by the Spirit. He is seeing this is what, how God operates. That's why the fullness of the God had dwelt in him. He knew the nature of God. He knew the reality of God. And so when he acted by the Spirit to... Heal all those that were oppressed and, and, and of the devil, right? And, and sickness and so on and so forth. All the things that he was doing, he was doing by the anointing or by the presence of the Holy Spirit, witnessing to him. The Spirit of God. So we can confuse this and say, well, the Holy Spirit hadn't been given out. Come on, God is a spirit. He was always a spirit. He's always been a spirit. And that's why it gets confusing to us when we say, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, or it's the Spirit of God, or it's the Holy Spirit. It's the same. It's the same thing. Praise the Lord. And so, amen. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and he sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. That's called revelation knowledge or scriptural illumination. 
the Holy Spirit quickened that to him, and he said, whoa, that's me. That's why I'm here. That's what this is all about. We have the tendency to think that he just got out of uh, Mary's womb and just was gone. Yeah. No, he had to learn. It's, the scripture says he, he grew in wisdom and in stature. His knowledge was increased by the Holy Spirit. And the more he began to lean on the Holy Spirit, the more impact his life had. The more of a revelation of God he became. Right? Guess what? That's what we got to do. We have to be led by the Holy Spirit. We've got to not be afraid to make a mistake. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying be ignorant and just crazy, but I'm saying if, if we're afraid. See, God told me, this is what God told me when I left the organization I was ordained in. And we were pastoring in Ankeny. And it was chaotic. But we had some successes. We saw people healed and saved and different things. And the Lord told me one day, some people got up and walked out because I wouldn't preach about hell. And I asked him, literally, what about hell is it you want to know that you think you need to know? You're not going there. I mean, if you're born again, who cares what's going on in hell? Right? So I'm not going to spend all my time scaring you about hell when you're not going there anyhow. Let's focus on heaven. Let's focus on what God wants to do in this. Anyway, it made them mad, and they left. And that, shortly after that, I just finally said, I was praying in the... It was, used to, it was the old VFW in Ankeny. It was a bar. And we gutted it and remodeled it and the whole thing. Turned into a pretty cool place. And I'm in there one day and I'm praying. And the Lord literally said this. Now, I've heard other people say this since, but I'm, I swear before God, this is what God said to me. I didn't hear it from somebody else. It was from God. And he said, Nathan, if you don't stop, start reading this Bible as if you had never read it before, nothing is ever going to change. How was I reading it? I was reading it by the inspiration of the UPC. I was reading it by what I had been taught by them. And I believe that because I actually did get born again in a church service there, that everything that they were saying must be true. Now, I'm not ridiculing or putting it down. I mean, come on, anybody that's honest knows nobody knows at all. I mean, I don't care what organization they are, what denomination. I'm just saying what God told me was, unless you approach this thing with a different mind, with a different... In other words, don't come with preconceived ideas. Come and just let me reveal to you what I'm trying to do. It's been a process. It's been, I don't know, 20 years? And little by little, I'm learning. I'm, God is revealing things to me, and as he does to all of us. I mean, none of us are where we were 20 years ago, spiritually speaking. But I'm just saying, what the Holy Spirit was telling me is, you've got to quit thinking the way you always think if you're going to think the way God thinks. You're going to have to let God do some thinking for you and inspire you by the Holy Spirit. And that's what God wants to do. I, I mean, I could, because I have all kinds of friends and, uh, that are still you know, pastors and uh, evangelists and stuff in the UPC. There was me and another young guy at the time. We'd go around and we'd preach wherever our pastor was supposed to preach. He'd send us. And one of us would preach the morning message and the other one would preach the evening message. We were in every church imaginable on the east, east side of southeast Texas and western Louisiana. I mean, and we were just echoing a message that we heard somebody else preach. And it wasn't like we weren't trying to you know, we were just trying to figure out the whole process, but we were basically just reinforcing what they already believed. We, 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 we would have been, what do you call it? Uh, well, I'll just say it the easy way. We would have been kicked out, <laughs> amen, if we had preached anything other than that. Amen. And so when I, when I got into the organization, I came here to Iowa, and uh, I had to meet the, the board and the Iowa board and so forth, and they asked me questions, you know, like they always do, and what are you, this and that and the other, and we want to help you. We want to support you. And I said, no, uh, I don't want your support. I don't want your financial support. I just want your okay to start a church. Because I knew if they're supporting me, they're going to control me. I'm not stupid. I worked in sales for years and money talks so I didn't want that influence I didn't want that, those controls or those means by which they could manipulate me so I we were independent we I was a UPC preacher but the church was an independent church it wasn't under the organization's uh, control and so when I started preaching some more like grace messages and things nothing like what we're doing today but just variations deviations from from their stuff they 
I'd have to go see the district superintendent. I mean, I had to go to all of them. The district superintendent, I had to go to the local presbyter. Two or three times this stuff would happen because somebody would rat me out. Somebody would come into the church, and I was trying to set them free, but they didn't want freedom. They wanted more captivity, and so it made a man. They'd run and say, oh, he's over there preaching. It's like John. Now, here's, the, here's the beauty of this thing. I won't go into it anymore. I'm just ranting now. But I'm just saying, the Holy Spirit gave me the courage to say, I'm sorry. I don't have anything against you folks. I, I love you. I appreciate you. <clears throat> but I can't. I just can't keep going down that same road when the Holy Spirit's trying to tell me something different. I'm not, I'm not demeaning you. I'm not ridiculing you. I'm just saying, you don't own me. I, I'm God's. I'm, I belong to God. And if I'm going to do what God wants me to do, there's going to come a time when we're going to butt heads here. And it, I, I don't want it to be that way, but it's just the way it is. Amen. John, some of those folks came to this church when we first moved here. And John and I and a couple other guys, we were putting in the can lights and doing some work up in the attic. And uh, one of the guys from the other church asked John, he said, uh, does he preach standards? A standards being women don't cut their hair. They wear women's clothes and, you know, skirts, dresses, so forth. And the men, you know, clean shaven and Pretty much we got away with anything, but the women had to pay the price, praise the Lord. But nevertheless, they said to John, they said, Brother Nathan, does, he, does Brother Nathan preach standards? And John said, standards? He barely has any morals. <laughs> oh, I laughed. I thought that was hilarious. I thought it was the best answer that could have been given. If, if they had asked me, I wouldn't have been able to come up with it. It was too good. But I, I thought, yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, you may notice they're not with us anymore, but praise God. Yeah, I mean, come on. I'm talking about when I left. A guy came to me. I was right. I had a Harley, and uh, I was, I don't know. Oh, I was, I was working at Eagle. And he came there and waited for me when I come out the gate when my shift ended. He was waiting for me there. And he said, Brother Hamlin, the Lord has spoke to me. that if you don't come back, he's going to take your life. I, I swear, this was a guy who had claimed to be my friend before. And I said, well, I appreciate that, brother. Thanks for the heads up. And I just went on, got on my bike, and roomed off. Well, about a week later, I flipped it end over end on a high, where they were doing construction on the north side of Ankeny, or on the south side of Ankeny. And a car turned just as I was coming on to the main road there and there was no shoulder they, in fact there was a drop off about that much where they hadn't poured the shoulders yet and that nose of the bike hit it because I looked and then I looked back and by the time I looked back I was off the road and the nose of the bike dropped in that hole and I just flipped it end over end and I ended up in the middle of the road with a concussion and half an ear and a bunch of other junk and I thought I was laying in the hospital when I came to because it was a while before I came to, out of it but when I came to I thought I bet they're shouting the victory right now, thinking, yeah, well, there you go, Nate. You go, he got you. No, I wasn't looking, and the guy who was driving the car wasn't looking, and so we ended up in a mess. But it wasn't God. It was God that kept me alive. Amen. But I'm just saying, that's what religion can do. That's, that's what not listening to the Holy Spirit can cause people to do. And do you, can you imagine being an unbeliever and have somebody talk to you that way? God's going to kill you for that. God's going to get you. You know, you, you did that. That was a bad thing you did. Or you made a poor choice, and now God's going to punish you. God's going to... Who the... I mean, everybody would be running from God. Why, why would they want to come to a God who they think is going to beat them up as soon as they get within reach of Him? Amen? And all the time, God is saying, I just want to love you. I, I just want to forgive you. I just want to share my truth, my reality with you. I'm not trying to get you to follow a bunch of rules and regulations. I'm trying to get you to understand how much I love you and how much I need you to love others. To reveal me in this earth. Praise the Lord. So, Isaiah 55, 10 through 13. Sorry, that was, a, that was more than a rabbit trail. That was a downright hair rut. Praise the Lord. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now, before this, God says, my ways are not your ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. Now, he's talking to people who don't believe. Because once you become a believer, 
Your thoughts can be the same as his thoughts. Your, your, you can believe the same as he does. Your ways can be the same as his. Amen? Because he's given us his will and his way. Right? So as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, now he's talking about the word of God. And it doesn't return hither, but it waters the earth. In other words, it doesn't come down for no reason. It doesn't just rain because God's angry and wants to drown everybody. No, it rains because the earth needs moisture in order to produce. So it's just like rain or snow from heaven, it's coming to help produce something in the earth, to create something in the earth. Amen. And it makes it to bring forth and bud, makes it fruit, right? Amen. Give, bear fruit. And that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Amen. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It will not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out. Now look, here's the result of that. Well, you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Right now, in all of this junk, if we, if we keep our focus on what God has said, what He sent His Word to us for, to bring us peace, to deliver us, to heal us, to, to provide for us, to protect us, amen, then we'll go out with joy. And we'll be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. All the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Praise the Lord. To move in faith is both a gift and a fruit of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. It's moving in the mind of Christ. He said, put on the mind. It's walking with God. Praise the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. Yes. Romans 8, 6. Praise the Lord. For to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Amen. If, you're, if we're looking at all this stuff with a carnal mind or the natural mind, carnal mind doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It just means it's just natural. It's just the normal way of thinking. It's death. It's fear. It's stress. It's anxiety. It's all of the things that bring early death. Amen. But to be spiritually minded or in agreement with this, it's life. It's peace in the midst of the storm. Amen. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. I think that is what happens here on Sunday mornings when we're sharing as the body. It brings peace. It does me anyway because I'm hearing things that resonate with my spirit. I'm hearing things that I'm thinking, yes, thank you, Jesus. That's the Lord talking to me. He's, he's talking through John. He's talking through Sally. He's talking through Ron, through Don, through Tim, right? Through Eric and Rita. I mean, whoever. We're, we're the body. So let the peace of God rule. Amen? God's peace, in other words, ought to override every bit of confusion, every bit of doubt, and every bit of fear. Praise the Lord. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Praise the Lord. About done here would be done if I hadn't gone off in the nut track. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. In other words, don't be careful. Don't care about everything. Don't be worried about everything. Don't be freaking out about everything. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Isn't that what Tim said? Don't just come with your problems. I mean, it's okay, you can share that stuff, but I'm saying what God is saying, come to me with thanksgiving for what I've done, for what you know I will do, if you'll just have confidence in me. And the peace of God will overcome all that. Amen? The peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe it. The greatest revelation of God's Word is in our future. Amen. No matter how much we've received. And I, I, I'm telling you, when I think about the grace message and all the things that we're, we're experiencing, those are tremendous, huge. I mean, when I think back 20 years before this, I mean 30 years now before this, and where I am today, I'm talking about just understanding. 
And I don't mean this in an arrogant way. I just mean it's light years because of revelation. Not because of me being better or being really good, but because of revelation, because of the Holy Spirit quickening this truth. Amen? For such a time as this. Amen. 1 John 5.13. 1 John 5.13. Finally, brethren, uh, these things have I written unto you, believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, what is the name of the Son of God? The Word of God. Amen? The Word of God. So this is the day and this is the hour that we have to learn the language of the Spirit. Amen? So that we can comprehend what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen? He's speaking to the church by the Holy Spirit the same way God spoke to Jesus. Amen? Now we are the Jesus in this earth and that same God by His Spirit is speaking to us in the same way. Praise the Lord. This is the day and the hour. Hebrews 4.12. Praise the Lord. And I think it, a lot of times these things just take a... It, it takes a, a shift... For me, it was shifting from feeling obligated to an organization that had been good to me and had given me opportunities. But I had to, at some point, I had to make a decision that was awkward. It wasn't comfortable. It wasn't a decision I wanted to make. But it was a decision I had to make. I couldn't keep doing what I had been doing, knowing that there was so much more that I was never going to be able to experience, never going to know that about God, if I wasn't willing to let go of that religious stuff. And it wasn't all bad. Don't misunderstand me. I had some, there was some tremendous revelation come from there. But there was a lot of bondage, too, and a lot of things that kept us from being led by the Spirit because we had to depend on men or women to give us the okay. Praise the Lord. So for the Word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Praise the Lord. So we've got to allow the Holy Spirit and the Word to operate in us, exercising our spiritual senses. That's what it does. It, it will tell you what is natural and what is spiritual. He'll tell you if this is just a religious function you're going through or if this is actually God trying to lead you in a direction where He can be effective in somebody's life, including our own. Amen? Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, so uh, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. Suzanne's going to have to have her nails done this week. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know, I think sometimes the, the more rigid or, or ritualistic or religious the group, the organizations may be, the more uh, immature the majority of the people are. Which is why a guy would come to me and say, God's going to kill you you know, if you don't come back and agree with us. Now, if that's not immaturity, I don't know what is. That's just somebody who does not comprehend God, who doesn't have a revelation of God. Not a true one. I mean, not a, a valid one. Or they'd never say God's going to kill you. They'd say, you know, come back. Let's try to work this out, whatever. Instead of threatening me with my life from God, you know, that's the, that's the thing. We, we need to know. We have to have our senses exercised to discern what's God and what's just human. What's, what does what the world want and what does God want? And the Holy Spirit will do that. He'll exercise. He'll tell us the difference between our reasoning, our soul, and our spirit. Our carnal mind and the mind of the spirit. He'll tell, you'll know. I mean, come on. All of us that have moved from one place to another, and that's all of us to some degree, know 
that it took something of the Holy Spirit to get us to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to give something else a try here. I'm going to have to move in another direction here. Right? That's the Holy Ghost. And if you don't do it, you're stuck with what you got. Because he won't beat you over the head and drag you out of there. You have to make a decision. Saying, okay, I believe this is you, Lord. Now, see, that's what I'm talking about here. We cannot be afraid to make a mistake. We will make mistakes. Amen? But the more we learn to discern the voice of God, the more we get to the place where we depend on this, the voice of God, the less mistakes we'll make. And God won't punish you for making a mistake. He rewards you for having the courage to take a step of faith, even if it's wrong. And he'll protect you in that step. Amen? Think about Paul. I mean, if it was about making mistakes, we're going to cost you your life. Paul would have fried. He wouldn't have saw a light from heaven. He'd have been crispy critter. He'd have been burned up by that light from heaven. No, God said, I, I love this guy before the foundation of the world. Amen? I want him to understand me. I want him to know me. I want him to be able to share me with other people. I don't want to kill him. I want to save him. I want to give him life and that more abundantly. Praise the Lord. Praise God. All right, Hebrews 6, and we'll wrap up with this. I'll, I'll stop. Hebrews 6, I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's uh, 20 verses. Hebrews 6, 1 through 20. And this is where the Lord has been speaking to me, and this is where I come from with most of this. Praise the Lord. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we, will we do, if God permit. For it's impossible for those who were once enlightened. In other words, he said, let it, leaving that, he said, and that's what we're going to do. If God permits us to, we're going to leave all of that. For it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, it's impossible for them to renew them again unto repentance. Why? Because there's only one way, and that's Jesus. Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. They're not saying, if you make a mistake, you know God's... Out. No, he's saying, if you choose some other path now, after having known the Lord... He's not saying, I'm going to kill you. He's saying, there's no other way to be saved. You're not going to find another way. You're going to have to come back to this, because this is the only way for you to be saved. For the earth which drinketh in the rain, that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Now, you could look at that in a million different ways, but the way I'm seeing it is God, Jesus said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. Yes. Not thorns, not thistles, not things that are harmful to people, not things that are painful to people, but things that bless people, that benefit people, that heal people, that give them sustenance and so forth. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation Though we thus speak, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abram, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. This is where we're at right now. We can make all the promises we want. The government can make all the promises. The scientists can make all the promises. But the pro bottom line is, it's God that's going to give us the answer. Wherein, willing more abundantly to show their, unto the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a, have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. He is our refuge. He is our habitation. Praise the Lord. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. In other words, we get this lined up with this. Praise the Lord. 
whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Praise the Lord. Give God a hand this morning. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. I, and that's why I'm excited. I, I, I honestly believe we are on the precipice of what God's going to do in this last day. And we are going to be the ones to enjoy and experience it. Amen. If we don't faint. Praise God. Let God be the, the final word in every situation. And we'll come out winners every time. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week. Happy Fourth of July. God bless America.